And our first plenary is, in fact, entitled Framing New Mobility Going Beyond the Hype. And if you hear a slight ring of skepticism in that title, you're not mistaken. New transport technologies and business models are generating a lot of hype. Yet these developments sometimes seem to raise as many questions as they answer, starting with identifying what it is we're talking about. There is no standard definition of what constitutes new mobility. Conventional wisdom sees the future of mobility as autonomous, shared, and electric. Some of those uh, were on that central big uh, part of the word cloud. But the fact is that the pace and the shape of this transition still remain quite uncertain, with some changes likely to play out over a long ter longer term than others. And it is by no means evident that all cities and countries across the globe should approach new mobility in the same way. What works in one place under a particular set of conditions and cultural, condition, uh, cultural circumstances may not work as well in another place. Hence, we want to devote this session to exploring what exactly we mean when we talk about new mobility. And to get us started, we've asked an award-winning thought leader to share his perspective on which key technologies and approaches hold promise in the short, medium, and long term, and on what it will take to fulfill that promise, which prerequisites must be met for new mobility to deliver those benefits that we listed there in that poll, and which clearly many of you believe it will be delivering, namely in terms of sustainability and access. Please welcome with me the founding director of the Institute of Transportation Studies and founding chair of the Policy Institute for Energy Environment and Economy at the University of California at Davis. He's the Distinguished Blue Planet Prize Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Environmental Science, and he holds the Automotive Engineering seat on the California Air Resources Board. His most recent book is an entitled Three Revolutions, Steering Automated, Shared, and Electric Vehicles to a Better Future. Dan Sperling, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's, it, it really is a uh, great pleasure to be here. And it's really a great pleasure to see so much interest in this, in transportation. I won't even say transforming transportation. I've been working in this field for, let's just say, decades. And in fact, I recall very clearly coming to the original meetings of uh, the WRI, Transforming Transportation. I think it was called something a little different then. And it was a much smaller crowd. You know, I remember Lee Shipper was one of the organizers. And the focus was more on bus rapid transit, you know, demand, you know how to provide more services to low-income people in developing countries. It was nothing like what we're talking about today. And in fact, um, 20 years ago, I created a center for new mobility studies at UC Davis uh, with an endowment from Honda Motor Company. And within a few years, it died. I actually did it with someone you might know, Susan Shaheen. She was my graduate sc student at the time. And we launched that. There was no interest. There was no money. It was almost dead on arrival. It was very disappointing. Well, 10 years later, the iPhone came along and smartphones and automation and Uber and Lyft and Didi. It's a whole new world now. So to kind of frame this, you know, I think, you know, so we heard in the welcoming talks, you know, transportation's connected to everything and, and has good and bad and there's solutions. But I think it's really good to ground this discussion in the reality that in most places, transportation as we know it is not working very well from Africa to Los Angeles. And these are just some images to highlight that. I, I really think one or two of those images come from Lee Shipper, those of you who remember him. In the old days, we didn't worry about copyright and IP so much, uh, so I don't really, <laughs> but I think it's from Lee. Um, 
So if we think all those problems are challenging, uh, this is a previous book I did, Two Billion Cars with Debbie Gordon. Uh, and, and that's a forecast from 10 years ago, but those forecasts are still uh, correct. Any way you look at it, the expectation is there's going to be a lot more motor vehicles in the world. And I'll talk about that's good and that's bad, but for the, all those bad things we talk about, it's only going to make it worse, certainly in terms of carbon, certainly in terms of urban congestion. So we need to appreciate that motor vehicles have, and I won't even say motor, when I say motor vehicles, I mean two-wheelers, uh, motorized two-wheelers and up, have tremendous allure, provide tremendous benefits everywhere. But as I said, we've gone too far. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a California image of going too far. If that person would get out of the SUV and walk the dog, They'd be healthier, be less cost, less greenhouse gases. <laughs> but it's not just the US. <laughs> Walking the camel. <laughs> and, uh, and, and here's a, just another image of, uh, of the allure uh, of, of motorized transportation. OK, so this is kind of a str strong statement. You know, I'm an academic. We're not lent to making strong, absolute statements. But I think we've got to really acknowledge we've got a really big problem, that our transportation systems almost everywhere are not functioning well. We've become too, certainly in all the OECD countries, and really in many of, of the Asian countries, many of the Latin American countries in particular, we've become too dependent on cars. And so these are just, this, these are actually numbers, uh, graphics from the United States, and you come up with slightly different versions for other places. But what can, you can see there is um, vehicle use per capita, where we already have saturation, you know, in some ways, saturation of infrastructure and where we have a tremendous amount of mobility and accessibility. We see VMT, vehicle miles traveled per capita, going up. We see transit ridership going down. We see average car occupancy going down a lot. I just saw a number. It, 40 years ago in the United States, we had 1.9 people per vehicle for an average trip. Now it's 1.4. I mean, that's a huge change. So that by itself explains a lot of the problem that we have. And at the same time, traffic congestion just keeps getting worse. Now, to go back to that idea of mobility, you know, something I always tell my grad students, my students, they always say, well, have we reached saturation? And I said, no way. I said, and this is going to set up uh, our deputy mayor from Paris. I always say, if I could get to Paris in 20 minutes and it cost me $5, I'd be there every other night for dinner maybe even every night for dinner. And so it's a function of time and cost. So, you know, we think about the solution. So the way I've characterized these solutions, I call them the three revolutions, and that's the cover of the book there in the corner. And I've created a big research and policy program at my university that we're connecting also to many other places. And I have to say, I've given 80 public talks around the world on this topic. And it's because people haven't come to understand this idea that these big changes that are happening, they need to be integrated together in some way. I just came back from China a few days ago. They're going gung-ho on electric vehicles. They're they are world leaders. They're going gung-ho on automated vehicles. They expect to be world leaders. They're don't going gung-ho on shared mobility. DD is the largest uh, ride-hailing company in the world by far. But then you suggest, well, maybe link them together? And that's when you get the real benefits. And 
you know, almost to the person, they say, wow, we hadn't really thought about that. So it goes back to that idea, this, you know, silo thinking. We need to integrate it together. And I use the word pooling instead of sharing because what we really need is to increase the utilization of the vehicles. As, as someone said here, you know, if you have Uber or Lyft or Didi with just one passenger, you're not, you're not providing much societal benefit. But if you have two or three, now you're talking. Okay, so I was asked, like, what's really happening? Okay, so first of all, something that really is happening is this idea of uh, very small vehicles, what we're starting to call micro-mobility. And in the US, uh, the scooters in particular, that's me in Los Angeles, on the sidewalk illegally uh, with my little electric scooter. Um, and I use the word illegally because we do, cities have no idea how to deal with these changes that are coming. So one of the themes here and this is true almost around the world, almost every city around the world is, they are not prepared for these changes. You know, as I said, I've been, you know, in the wilderness for 30 years with transportation. Nothing's happened, been very little innovation. And a lot of transit operators, cities, their capacities have really diminished because it all got routinized and there wasn't much innovation or change. Now. There's all this change, and they don't know how to deal with it. They feel like Uber and Lyft came along and, and just ran them over figuratively, sometimes literally, <laughs> figurative, figuratively, and they're not going to let that happen again. And so now my, my little city of Davis, which is the perfect place for electric scooters, we've got lots of protected bike lanes, None of no one's going to use it on the sidewalk. It's safe. The city is committed to sustainable mobility. Even they put a, a ban, a temporary ban on e-scooters just because they felt like they got to get their heads around and get control of it. It's the wrong way of thinking. I'm going to emphasize, come back to that. Okay, so e-scooters, they're popular because they're easy to use and they're fun and they really work. Um, we have, and, and the, it is happening. And then we have uh, the ride hailing services, the DD and Uber and Lyft and, and, and many others. They are really thriving also because, one, they're chauffeured, um, they're lower cost than, than driving, and they're easy. They really made the, the, uh, it very easy to do and electrification. So, you know, there was a discussion here about the World Bank strategy. I would say, forget about integrating. I get the electricity people to decarbonize the grid and get the transportation people to electrify the vehicles and don't get caught up in the challenge of how to integrate it all together. They're both going to happen. There's no doubt they're gonna happen at different paces in different ways, so get on with it because each side has tremendous challenges. So I'm, this is me, the incrementalist, the policy wonk, not the brilliant visionary. Um, I'll leave that for another time. And partially automated vehicles are happening. And uh, I wanna make the point there that driverless vehicles, truly driverless, that's when you potentially get lots of benefit as well as potentially lots of cost. What we have now and what we're gonna have for many years is really not gonna provide much societal benefit, little benefit in safety and some other small benefits. So I wanna highlight that the disruptions are happening. The first major one has been the effect on taxis. In the US, every taxi company is either bankrupt or in serious financial trouble. They've lost half their ridership in the last seven years. And you can see TNCs, meaning Uber and Lyft, have had tremendous growth. In fact, by the end of this year, there'll be more uh, ridership on Uber and Lyft than there will be on transit, on, on bus transit in this country. So what's on the cusp, like what's happening? Um, we have microtransit, which is a, which is a great concept. 
and that is taking basically the app-based demand responsive uh, technology and service model that Uber and Lyft have developed and applying it to sm essentially small buses. It's a great concept, but institutionally, it runs into all kinds of problems. Most of the microtransit companies are struggling or failing. Probably the one successful one is Via, and they've got a lot of complicated business models. So this is a complicated one. It kind of builds on all the kinds of uh, paratransit services that exist in Asia and Latin America. Um, Self-driving cars. Um, there are some niches for it. It's not going to become this fully driverless vehicle system. That's probably quite a ways off, but there is a lot of the technology coming in. There are some niche opportunities. Um, self-driving, uh, which I, uh, self-driving for, for trucks actually is, has some appeal. It'll be happening probably a little faster. Um, it's going to actually be for long haul trucks. It's used to make driving easier. And I got lots of anecdotes, but you know, I, I could spend days talking about this, so I'll, I'll leave that. But there's lots of examples of this. And um, there's an, I just got back from China. And so as I said, China is just forging ahead so much on all of these technologies very aggressively. So they had a, that's just an example of a little automated vehicle, driverless, and that, will, that makes uh, deliveries for local goods, food, other kinds of products. And they had a whole, they had a whole range of these vehicles sitting out there, proto uh, actually more, some of them prototypes, some of them actually in, in usage. And then there's the small buses that also is, this is also from China, but there's uh, quite a number of other companies around the world doing this, small little shuttles that are, they are the three revolutions. They are automated, they're driverless, and they're electric. And so this is really a promising, but it, again, it's a niche application. So what should government do? So this is my, kind of summary on it, hopefully it'll inspire discussion here. Um, I have been immersed in this, so I've been talking to mayors and city councils all over the world, Uber, Lyft, Didi, uh, state governments, national governments, General Motors, Ford, VW, and so on. Electrification, it's a no-brainer, it's happening, all the car companies are committed to it. Um, it's like, don't even think about it, about if, think about how, everywhere. And for everything, in California, by the way, our, our, so I'm part of that California Air Resources Board. We regulate the entire transportation system. We do all the cap and trade. Our policy, our goal is electrification of the entire transportation sector. You know, maybe not some of the big long haul trucks, but everything short of that, and maybe even that, that is the, policy and, and we're putting the money in place and the incentives to do that. Um, pooling, again, this is a no-brainer. This is what everyone should be doing, not asking questions. So if you're dealing with a Uber, you support, you incentivize pooling. You disincentivize a single passenger service, you incentivize it. In fact, this fits with the Uber and Lyft and DD business models. They're not gonna fight that. They, in fact, agree that that is the correct business model to support pooling. Um, linking transit to mobility services. Transit is the, you know, in some places it's the safety net, in other places it's the backbone of our transportation system, but they don't, it doesn't work well in a lot of places. It's hugely expensive when you get outside the dense corridors. There needs to be an aggressive, explicit effort to take these new mo private new mobility services and link it with these transit operators. And it's happening a little bit in a lot of places, but it's really just at the beginning. And to emphasize a point that was made earlier, you know, everything I'm saying, the details vary dramatically from one place or another, but these are fundamental principles and strategies. And so just to kind of end it, some of my key insights here is, 
do not get caught up on all these moonshots. <laughs> they're not gonna happen, or at least they're not gonna happen in any major way anywhere. With all due respect to Elon Musk, who's brilliant <laughs> in so many ways, the Hyperloop is not going to play a big role anywhere. Um, okay, so enough said on that. Uh, <laughs> um, and there's all kinds of reasons. I can go into all the reasons why. And, and a lot of them are institutional, legal, perceptions, laws. We need to focus, and so the point is, we need to focus on incremental change. It's great to have vision, I like vision, but we need to figure out what we can do now that makes sense. And there's a lot, this is like the most rich time in transportation history since the Model T uh, for transportation. So there's plenty on the plate. And part of it is we really need to focus on transit. And, and this is certainly a US story, but it's a lot of other places too. That you know the, the motorization, the car-centric cities and so on, has really undermined uh, transit and in many ways highlighted its weaknesses. So we need to figure out how to let transit do, conventional transit do what it does well and then mix it with these other modes. And equity, as we heard many times, equity is, has to be central to everything we're talking about, at equity of access and mobility. And as I said earlier, we need to uh, we need to focus on the capacity of cities and our transit operators. So, and pooling and pricing. So another thing, what do we need to be doing? Increase utilization of vehicles and somehow get pricing in there. And I work in the political arena, I know all the problems with that, but there's lots of creative ways of doing it. We call them incentives, we, we hide it in different ways. It's got to be done. And so, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Dan Sperling, you can take this seat right here because we're going to move directly to our panel and uh, want to hear from you in the course of it as well. So we will now drill deeper on what we have just heard from Dan Sperling. Lots of uh, ideas there to work with. What lessons can we learn from the pioneers, from cities and companies in the developed and developing world that are experimenting with the different technologies that Dan has just taken us through, with electrification, with sharing models, and the possibility of AI-directed autonomous vehicles? How do the new trends affect the roles of the public and private sector actors, and how can they better work together going forward? And what should national and local governments focus on in order to shape an enabling framework for sustainable new mobility? Dan gave us some ideas in that direction, and we're going to pick up on them now in more detail with an excellent international panel. It brings together pioneering decision makers from the public and the private sectors. May I ask the panelists for Plenary One to please now join me on stage? And you see your names up here. Those are the seats that you should please take. So, Robin, you'll be over here. Regina, you'll be here. Then we have Arti is in the middle. And Vice Mayor Nadowski, you'll be there, please. Sorry, it's a little tight. <laughs> please. So, welcome, everyone. It is a great pleasure now to introduce our panel, beginning with uh, the lady seated next to Dan Sperling, probably very familiar to many of you who have attended past uh, TTs. She is Robin Chase, and it's great to have her back uh, again. She's co-founder and former CEO of the global car sharing leader Zipcar, and she's also co-founder of Veniam, a network company that moves data between vehicles and the cloud. She's working with cities to support the transition to self driving cars. Great to have you with us, Robin. Next to Robin is Regina, hopefully I'm going to say the last name right, Clelo? 
Okay, is the CEO and co-founder of the mobility data management platform Populous. She's formerly a transport scientist at UC Davis, Berkeley, and Stanford, and she's done extensive research on the impact of ride sharing and automated autonomous vehicles on travel behavior and energy use. Great to have you with us. Next to her is Arti Merotra. She is Uber's regional general manager overseeing operations in the US and Canada for the bike and scooter rental subsidiary, Jump. She's grown and managed Uber in cities across the US and Canada. She began her career in investment banking and has held leading positions in finance as well as transport. Next to her, Christoph Nadoski is deputy mayor of transportation and public space for the city of Paris. He's a member of the Green Party, Les Verts, and he was appointed by Mayor Anne Hidalgo to focus, among other goals, on such aims as reducing air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, promoting better mobility access for everyone, and restoring public space for pedestrians and cyclists. Great to have you with us, an honor. And next to me is seated Mauricio Rodas. Uh, I, shall I say all four names, or are we good with those two? Those are good? Okay. He's the mayor of Quito. He served as executive director of the Latin American think tank Fundación Etos, which he founded, and he also founded Ecuador's SUMA political party. He serves as world co-president of the United Cities and Local Governments Organization, sits on the boards of Global Covenant, C40, and ICLEI, and he is a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. So great to have you with us. And what I'm going to do now is just go straight down the panel and ask all of you to share your thoughts on what we just heard from Dan Sperling. So he talked about these three revolutions of electrification, automation, and pooling. And I'd like to ask each of you, with reference to your particular city, country, or industry sector, which of these trends, in your view, offers the greatest potential for positive transformation in both the short and the longer term. And you're supposed to do all of that in three minutes, please, ladies and gentlemen. So I'll ask the mayor to get us started. Um, ah, okay, if you'll share that mic between mayors, that would be great. <laughs> it's on. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to the World Bank for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here and to have the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I think among those three topics, uh, for us, at least in Quito, the most important one has to do with electrification. Now, there's a number of challenges uh, around electrification. First of all, uh, the lack of appropriate uh, regulatory frameworks. I think we still lack uh, high quality regulatory frameworks to um, attract private investors, for example, to put money into uh, electric uh, vehicles in our cities. Second, I think w there's still a lot of uncertainty about technology. For example, in the city of Quito, we are uh, in the middle of the mountains. Uh, we are 2,800 meters above the sea level. So, so that poses a challenge in terms of technology for electric vehicles because we have very steep hills in our city. So there's still a lot of debate, for example, on what kind of batteries should you use to purchase uh, electric buses. So I think that there's still a lot of research to be done in terms of providing uh, decision makers at the public sector with the necessary certainty about, for example, what kind of electric buses should you purchase. Uh, and, I, and, and I think that cooperation and knowledge sharing is key for that. For example, uh, we have um, begun a purchasing process for electric buses, in, in, for electric articulated buses in the city of Quito, and we have asked for the technical support of C40, which is a, a network of cities that works on issues regarding climate change. Without that, uh, it would have been very, very difficult to go ahead with this process. So I think that institutions like the World Bank and, and others that do research on these things and support uh, local governments worldwide could be very, very helpful in providing with technical cooperation in terms of giving uh, local authorities the capacity to go ahead with these processes that are still very uncertain and that pose many risks. So I think that's, that's a big challenge in which we should all work. 
I don't know if I... Thank you very much. You my, my three you're goal. right on time. Okay. We just got the warning sign. So many thanks to that. I'll move straight away to the Deputy Mayor, and perhaps you can share your thoughts on Paris and new mobility. Uh, hello, good morning um, to all, and thank you for your invitation, and thank you also, Mr. Spelling, for your uh, very inspiring uh, speech. Um, in Paris, uh, when we are talking about uh, new mobility, new mobility, uh, what about uh, are we talking about? Uh, we are talking about the fact that uh, since uh, a few years, uh, since I am elected, uh, five years now, uh, 2014, uh, there are several waves of innovations that uh, shaped the transport uh, system and the, the landscape and the ecosystem of, uh, of mobility in Paris. Uh, we had, of course, uh, the right hailing and the right pulling. Uh, services that increased a lot, uh, Uber and other Zipcar also is uh, in Paris. Uh, we had also uh, the, mo the dockless uh, motorcycles and then also the dockless uh, bike uh, sharing systems uh, who have, uh, a v which have a, a very uh, a great success uh, in Paris because uh, Paris is a very dense city and for shorter trips uh, it, uh, it, it works very well. And then, uh, since last summer, we had the e-scooters. Uh, Paris, is, I think, is the, most, uh, the, the first city in the world uh, with the number of operators uh, for e-scooters because we have seven uh, operators today uh, of e-scooters. And, and it works also because we have thousands of uh, thousands of trips made every day, uh, even in winter and maybe the weather is milder in Paris than in Washington, but even in winter, we, it, it is su uh, successful. So uh, we are facing uh, a deep change, I would say, uh, also uh, in, the, um, in the landscape, as I said, and in the e ecosystem of mobility, and also on the paradigm of, uh, of using uh, vehicles. We are, shifting, we are shifting from the paradigm of ownership of a car to the use of uh, vehicles and shared v uh, vehicles. That is providing uh, some new opportunities, but also some new risks. New opportunities, uh, of course, it's, uh, I would say, more efficient system of tr transportation. Uh, we know that the car-oriented cities uh, are bringing uh, us uh, congestion and air pollution and also emissions of uh, uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, but also um, uh, other, uh, another opportunity is the fact that uh, we move towards a multimodal way of transportation. And it brings also the possibility for the people uh, to have a door-to-door, -door, uh, because it's a, it's a strong social demand today, to have a door-to-door -door service for the transportation. But it's also some risks. Uh, the risks are uh, the fact that uh, the acceptability for the people, for the citizens, when you have dozens of e-bikes or e-scooters uh, that are uh, in the middle of the sidewalk, yeah. the citizens won't accept that. And we saw that in San Francisco there were uh, also a, a kind of a revolt uh, against, uh, re rebellion against, against that. The, the, the other question, the other risk is the fact of the, that we have also the, fa the question of the congestion. If we have too many cars at the rush hour, we will have also congestion, even if it's uh, shared cars. We have also the question of, is it affordable for, affordable for all? Uh, because, for example, the e-scooters, when you make a 10-minute trips with an e-scooter, it costs you two and a half euros. So that means almost yeah. $3. So it's quite expensive for a short trip. And also the question is that these services that are provided by uh, um, private uh, companies are only available in the in the center of the city, not in the suburbs and in the outskirts. So these are the questions that are brought by this uh, new kind of uh, mobility. Great, thank you very much, and we'll pick up on a number of those later on. And I'm so glad you mentioned the acceptability of e-scooters because I live in Berlin, and the e-scooters drive in the bike lanes, and uh, they're tourists mostly using them, and they're looking back and forth and going very slowly, and it is a real. It's, it's a safety issue, and it's, it's a great hindrance for those who want to get somewhere fast in a bike lane. So um, thanks for pointing that out. Let's move on to, uh, uh, to Arti and hear about Uber's thoughts here. Well, thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. It's very exciting to be here. Thank you, Dan, for those remarks. I will tell you, they, they really resonate. Very, very salient to what we're doing day in and day out. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, from you know, my vantage point, given my role at Uber, 
I'm particularly excited about electric and about micromobility. I think that e-bikes and scooters you know, have the potential to really change the landscape, of course, um, and, and we certainly have a lot of work to do there, but we're, we're very, very excited about it in terms of its impact on congestion, affordability, being more eco-friendly, of course. And we've seen some really exciting initial data that makes us very optimistic when we actually look at our early adopters of jump bikes and we look at their usage of products like UberX and, and jump bikes, we see among these early adopters that they use bikes, they use these e-bikes often during times of congestion, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. when streets are particularly congested during peak traffic hours. And they're actually replacing UberX trips with bike trips, and that is really promising for us. That's, that's a good thing um, from, from our perspective, especially as we inch closer and closer towards um, you know, reducing personal car ownership. So that I think is really exciting for us. Uh, shared rides is another uh, important area that we've made a lot of investments in. Uber Pool um, is, is one that we uh, you know, really want to encourage, and, and I definitely agree with Dan on this. We, we, we want to encourage folks um, to use products like that. Um, we know that today about 20% of our global trips uh, actually occur on pool in cities where pool is available. So it's one that we think, again, has, has a lot of potential. Um, technology ha has come a long way and, and we have a lot of work to do there, but has provided some, some incredible benefits. I will say though that technology alone is, is not gonna solve everything, uh, to Dan's point as well. We're very um, excited to work with governments and, and are very supportive of things like congestion pricing. And we're actually working uh, in New York to enact comprehensive congestion pricing. It's, um, you know, it makes a lot of sense to have, you know, a, a car that is coming into a downtown area, for example, you know, an increased fee or increased prices and can actually use uh, that money to fund mass transit. Um, and that feels like a real win-win for everyone. So those are all trends that I think we're, we're investing in, paying cl close attention to. Won't happen, happen overnight, but um, we're very, very committed to making those, those possible. Thank you very much. We'll move straight on to Regina and hear your thoughts, perhaps from that big picture view, working with uh, a number of different cities. Um, so please. Great. Thank you. Um, so Dan knows me well, I've been in academia for quite some time, so I'll actually start there. One of the reasons why I decided to get a PhD in transportation um, and energy systems at MIT 10 years ago is because I wanted to solve this problem of growing transportation um, impacts on our environment. And I have to say, I'm kind of disappointed that we haven't made more progress. But I'm optimistic uh, today because I think that we are starting to see a shift um, and a couple of key um, factors that can affect how we move forward go in, in the future. Um, so with Dan's opening remarks, I think that we are not moving fast enough. We need all of these three things to happen in order to achieve progress. We need shared mobility, we need automation, um, and we also need electrification. Not any one of those is, is the most important. We need them all because we need to make progress faster. Um, I think that one of the really big challenges um, in integrating all of these opportunities is that there hasn't been a lot of coordination and collaboration between the private sector, which is where I am now, but haven't been for most of my career, and the public sector. And so really building a better collaboration through sensible policy, um, data transparency, um, and I'm also a fan of pricing, uh, to more efficiently move people in cities, whether it's in mass transit, where we can make it work, um, shared pooled vehicles, where maybe we don't have the infrastructure yet um, for that to work very well, um, or micromobility. And um, I have to say, of the most recent trends, I am very excited about micromobility. I do think that there are some key challenges um, around safety, um, in particular, but I do think that we are seeing a lot of people um, who are excited about using electric scooters and electric bikes. Um, we produce a report at Populous. We work with cities from coast to coast in the U.S. and now are talking to a lot of um, cities abroad about understanding how many people are using these services. Um, cities are starting to ingest data directly from shared bikes and scooters to plan better infrastructure. Uh, we need to build better infrastructure that moves as many people as efficiently as we can uh, in a limited amount of space, and to do that, 
um, with energy efficient options. So um, I'm very excited for the future. I think we've made a lot of progress in the last year and, and there's more to come. Thanks very much. Robin. Um, you know, if I have to choose, I choose shared. But <laughs> what I've been really struck by is if I think about what new mobility is, it's um, technology that's being applied to mobility. And for me, the greatest outcome of that is it's really increased the quality of service of shared assets, shared vehicles. And if we think of emerging economies, they've been sharing for a really long time. And this, if when we apply technology to it, we have really upped to the discoverability, the ease of use, knowing where you're going from and doing to. So I think that for me is a key piece of what, what's changed right now. Um, I want to direct you back to what I talked about last year, the rise of the shared mobility principles org, go look at them, and why I wanted to pull that up is it's, it, it focuses us on what are the key pieces to make this transition actually work for all of us. And I want to highlight two. Um, one talks about efficient use of street space and the other fair user fees across all modes. And I think those are two tools that cities have, is street allocation and this part around pricing and why their key is new mobility is saying we have this opportunity to have multi multiple modes, and we all know we've had before, we had personal cars and mass transit. Now we have this large suite of things, and in order to make fair street allocation and to order to make a level playing field among those modes, we have to make it fair. We have to do a much better job around pricing right now, personal car use and single occupancy Uber, Lyft, and taxis, and Didi, they aren't paying their fair share, which makes it very hard for shared scooters or bikes to, to be able to have sustainable business models. And for us to choose when we're going out and about, which mode do we choose? Electric scooters or my personal car? So pricing and space street allocation are key tools and signals where our priorities are. And I think, um, I'm going to maybe leave it at that for now. Thank, thank you, that was great. And we will, in fact, pick up uh, on that straight away. Let me ask Dan now to comment briefly on street allocation. Um, I said my piece on the electric scooters, but in general, maybe you can tell us if you see models of street allocation taking into account new mobility options that you think are working really well and what are the preconditions for them to succeed? So if you can do that briefly, then I have a second question for you about electrification, but let's start with that. Well, let me start with that precondition part of it. Now, the response to what's happening in Paris and a lot of other places is that um, my experience, wa okay, so there is the concern about the safety, about the clutter, and I have to say it's, th it's a paradigm change we're talking about, because right now, think about it, cars, are the clutter. And if we shift our thinking, instead of thinking about the scooters or the bikes being the clutter, I was in The Hague when a lot of this broke with the scooters, and I was stunned in The Hague. There are bikes strewn everywhere on the sidewalks, on the, you know, against the buildings. And if that was San Francisco, they would have freaked out. They would have said, this is totally unacceptable. But they've become accustomed to it. So a lot of this is kind of our mental models, our paradigms of what's appropriate. And we've become accustomed to devoting a huge part of our cities to parking and cars. Yeah. And we've got to change that. And I think we need to be biased in favor of these new choices and new options, You know, building on what Robin was saying and in Paris. Thank you very much. Let me go back to Paris uh, and uh, the deputy mayor and ask you, in terms of pricing, and of course it wasn't only related to new mobility, but, but France did make an effort to recalibrate pricing uh, in order to, be, to promote decarbonization and to integrate, uh, to internalize uh, costs and it generated a lot of pushback, as w I think all of us are aware, the, the yellow vests. So perhaps you can speak a bit, when we talk about government's role in setting up enabling frameworks to make all of this happen, to really give preference to low carbon modes, what in your opinion is gonna be crucial to 
make it politically acceptable? I would say that it's not a problem for the center of the cities, but we have a fracture be between uh, the people who are living in the center of the cities and the people who are living in the outskirts and in the suburbs, who are very dependent from cars and uh, who are uh, uh, spending a lot of money in, uh, uh, in, in the cars. So uh, um, the, the disorder that you see uh, actually in France uh, is, uh, um, is because, uh, it, it's because a, a, a part of this, uh, this question, but none just for, for that, because there are also other questions like, uh, I would say, the, the inequity of the taxes uh, uh, and the fact that we can't have an enver environmental uh, policy in France uh, if, if, if it is uh, understood like uh, something that is not uh, going uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the direction of something that is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, in, in the order of uh, justice, I would say. So the disorder that we are seeing I I is the fact that uh, we are living very well uh, in the, uh, without a car in the, in the center of the cities. Mm -hmm. For example, in Paris, we have just 37% of people who own a car. And this percentage is decreasing year by year because we have all the panel of services of mobility and we can, we can uh, live without a car uh, when we live in Paris. But when we, you live in the outskirts, you must have a car. So the question of the new mobility, sustainable and for all, these are, I think, the two main issues. What, what can be sustainable and what can be for all? We have also to, to resolve that fracture between the center of the cities, the metropolis, and the, the outskirts. Thank you very much. Um, uh, perhaps now back to Quito also uh, with a question about uh, equity and access as it relates to public transport to mass transit. Uh, again, Dan Sperling told us how very important that is. This is a priority for your uh, city government. On the other hand, you definitely face some challenges. You mentioned the fact that Quito is one of the highest cities in the world. It's also not a very dense city. It's uh, got a lot of sprawl, and you still have a very large share of transport that is being uh, accomplished in private motorized vehicles. So how do you begin shifting that balance toward public transit, which in fact offers enormous um, potential benefits in terms of inclusion and access? Well, I think that uh, being in the developing world also provides you with many opportunities. For example, in the case of Quito, uh, we have 73% of our population that use public transportation because they lack resources enough yeah. to buy a car. So that, that provides you with a great opportunity in terms of, of new mobility and climate change and many other issues. So um, what we are trying to do is to demonstrate that we could manage public transportation in a proper way and provide high quality service to all. So uh, what we are trying to do is to demonstrate that certain areas of the city uh, could become examples of how to fight uh, against climate change by providing at the same time a, a, a good service. For example, um, in the historical district of Quito, which is the largest of uh, all of Latin America, and it's something that all Quito citizens have in their hearts. We have a very special connection with our historical district. Um, we have uh, made a commitment to get to the year 2020 by having our historical district as a zero emission public transportation zone. To, to, to have it as a demonstration effect that this is possible and this is good for the people uh, and, and and, it, it, and it's feasible. And we, we, even though it's an, a very ambitious uh, goal, we are convinced we're going to achieve it because by the year 2020, we will have our first metro line, which is being constructed right now, um, ready. It will be operating by that time. And by that time, we will have a fleet of electric buses already uh, operating. And only those would be allowed to get into the historical district, as well as electric taxis. Only those would be allowed to get into the historical district, which 
uh, we, it, it's been uh, planned to have uh, an expanded network of pedestrian-only lanes that we have been constructing during the past few years. So, so having the metro, having um, electric buses, having electric taxis, and many people walking around the historical district will uh, make possible to decrease the level of pollution, will increase the level of commercial activity, economic development, job generation, attraction of tourists, and people will feel all these advantages. So therefore, it could be easier to expand this initiative in other areas of the city. That's the vision we have, and I think that, once again, we need demonstration effects for people to understand that this is not only possible, but it's good for everybody. Do you think that that's something that will truly shift people away from the idea of a personal vehicle as an aspirational model. It's something that's frequently been discussed here at this conference in the past, that in many developing countries in the world, cycling, walking, um, public transit use, that's poor people's transportation. If I have money, I want a private car. Do you think that's really going to change? I think that's possible as long as you provide people with high quality services. Uh, and I think that you should target to the middle income people. Because probably the, 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 you know, the, the upper class would never stop using a car because of many different reasons which I don't agree with, but unfortunately, it, that's a reality. But if you focus on the middle and low income people, uh, providing them with a high quality service, then that might be possible. Uh, because the only way to, to disencourage middle-income people from buying a car is actually convincing them that it's faster, cheaper, and easier to use public transportation, but that it's only gonna happen if you provide a very high quality service. Thanks very much. Let me now jump over to um, Robin and uh, Arti and ask you about the trade-off between shared and pooled. Um, because Robin, you said that if you had to choose one thing, it would be shared. But shared, as Dan pointed out, is not necessarily pooled. And I've asked you this question before, but I, I have to ask you again. When we talk about new mobility, we're often focusing on EVs and AVs, uh, autonomous and electrified. Don't both of them just keep us tied to the car? And particularly, don't they offer uh, the potential uh, or don't they have the potential that we will simply remain tied to individualized motorized transport? No. <laughs> um, I think the definition of shared is much more broad for me. So if I think about shared, I want you to imagine a continuum of shared vehicle sizes. The metro and the BRT is at one end of a shared transport going all the way up to me alone in my Uber or maybe even my bigger black car with leather seats and the whiskey closet. And if we think about that as a continuum of shared and coming down to this piece of pricing, I need to feel the signal of how much space I'm consuming on the street. And so am I gonna be choosing the cheaper mass transit during peak times or am I gonna be choosing my whiskey closet fancy black car? But that would be so many more multiples and we, and, uh, when the mayor of Quito talks about quality of service, I really believe that this is, I just wanna reemphasize this point that when, if we reallocate street space to say half of the street is active and shared small micro mobility modes for the 50% of trips that are short, less than three miles or less than five kilometers, that means we only have half the space left for large motorized vehicles and in that 50% that's left, if we make it only for shared, where am I gonna be driving my personal car? Because I've now signaled in my cities that I'm not letting personal cars that are personally owned, there's no space for you on the streets because it's either half active or half shared. Um, and I just wanted to just tie this to the opening remarks when we talk about the 1.3 million deaths, which are incredibly high in emerging markets. Those are people who are pedestrians who have no space. And if they had the actual fair allocation of space to correspond to the 50% of trips that are very short, 
we would be dramatically cutting that. But today we give everything to cars, and those are primarily personal cars. Ati, I want to ask you in just a second about jump and microtransit, but let me just ask you briefly to address the point that Robin made in her earlier remark, saying that you said, okay, 20%, uh, I think it is, of uh, rides are being taken in pooled vehicles. The question is, how do you, oh, or do you really have an interest in upping that share and cannibalizing your single service, your Uber X? Is that truly in the interests of Uber? And if yes, how are, how are you going to do that? How do you nudge more Uber riders to take the pooled services? I have to say my experience hasn't been too great. I've tried it a couple of times, and um, it's been very unreliable in terms of the time I'm going to have to wait for pickup. Just being frank, but so, yeah. yeah no, I, I appreciate that. You know, I think ultimately it comes down to creating a transportation ecosystem where riders and, and users of these services feel confident and know that, for example, when they open up a specific platform, they have access to reliable forms of transportation that will suit their specific need. So, you know, if it is um, you know, highly congested, a lot of traffic, they have access to micro-mobility. If they're seeing inclement weather, maybe they want to take a longer trip, maybe they may uh, look at an option like pool or, um, or something similar. And I think when you have those modes of transportation working together seamlessly in a way that is reliable, it gives folks that confidence that they can actually, you know, think about giving up their personal cars and it becomes a reality. So I actually think that that is very, very much in line with our vision for the future. It, we, we imagine a world in which, you know, you can get up in the morning and say, okay, it's, it's raining outside, maybe I'll take a pool. Um, maybe I will take that pool to a metro station. I'll take a metro. Maybe I'll get off of that metro station and take a bike to, uh, to achieve that last mile to get to the office. And having that um, very, very seamless experience, I think, will actually unlock the ability to eventually reduce car ownership in the future. I think that's certainly in everyone's best interest, and we're actually big supporters of that, which is why we're investing in all of these new technologies, which is why we're very, very comfortable with the notion that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that people are replacing some of their UberX trips with bike trips. And it actually works really well, I think, for the, for the ecosystem overall. Thank you. I'm going to come right back to you. Keep the mic, but Dan wants to interject. Yeah, so let me look at that, that answer from a policy perspective. And we have lots of tools to make that a more attractive, op the pooling more attractive, and we should be doing it. And I have to say, most mayors and city councils have barely thought about it, and almost none have done anything about it. So there's simple things that can be done. You go back to curb space. You can allocate more curb space to the vehicles that are pooled and less to those that are single passenger. You know, start at the airports, which is a no-brainer, you know, a place to start for that. And then you go to the pricing. So almost every single, so most cities are now taxing the TNCs. And, but what they're doing is just putting a flat fee per passenger. And New York was, uh, New York changed a little bit, but almost everyone is a flat fee. What they should be doing is put a big fee on the single passenger service and zero or very small if it's a pooled service. And that's just, I mean, that's something that can and should be done now everywhere. And it can progress, you know, Uber complains, you know, why are you just picking on us with all this pricing stuff? And so, you know, eventually we do want to apply it to single occupant vehicles and, and use, de you know, congestion pricing and a lot of other pricing. But there's things immediately that could be done to support this and make it a more attractive option. You know, everyone's going to make their own choices, but we have the tools to nudge people towards the pooling. Robin, very short. Okay, I have to introduce controversy. Dan. When you say a single occupancy taxi or Uber or Lyft deserves its fee, but a person driving their own car alone doesn't deserve a fee, that's ridiculous to me. No, I, I was not saying I said. Okay. <laughs> the political reality is it's a lot easier to start with Uber, but you know, ideally, I mean, it's, I agree 100% with you. Okay. 
end with Uber end of on that one. End of controversy. Let me, let me now come back to Arti, and then I want to bring in Regina as well on the issue of last mile services. So coming out of jump, and uh, we heard Dan in his remarks talking about the need to link public transit with private mobility services in that last mile piece. So could you perhaps share a few examples of how a company like Jump is working and partnering with the public sector to make that link happen? Absolutely. We uh, you know, think that transit is a crucial part of the transportation ecosystem in cities. And we've actually partnered with several transit operators in cities to, um, to help push more riders to uh, take transit. And, and first last mile solutions, I think, have worked really well, especially in places where I think traditional uh, public transport, um, it, it's been more difficult maybe to serve certain areas of, of a city. So a good example, I think, is in Boston, where we've worked closely with the MBTA on uh, paratransit um, services and really increasing level of service there. So when, when they're using Uber as an option to get to Metro Station, for example, you know, in the past, they would have to call ahead and reserve a ride a day in advance. And what we tried to do with them is combine our technology with their customer database of people that are already enrolled in paratransit services. And they're able to now, you know, seamlessly go into the app and MBTA will subsidize those rides. And um, that I think has worked really well. The partnership in Delhi, um, which I think is a great example of how some of these solutions can be so simple yet so effective. We actually have, um, uh, we've partnered with the Delhi Metro Rail system there. And we have Uber ride assistants that are there um, when people are looking to take an Uber from the metro station. So there's, there's a pickup drop off area. We have these assistants that are helping them, um, you know, find um, or request a ride and find their vehicles. Uh, we have signage there. We've taken a lot of pretty, pretty simple steps to make uh, that behavior and really encourage that behavior of first, last mile to get to metro stations uh, and go from there. DC, um, you know, uh, today has, has really welcomed uh, dockless bikes and, and scooters and, and has been a fantastic leader in this space. We've actually seen people using uh, these micro mobility models to get to and from transit as well, and they're actually expanding uh, their pilot, our pilot program here in terms of micro mobility. So I, I would say that um, we really, really want to come from a place of humility here. I think that we've evolved a lot as a company, and we have a lot of really exciting things to learn from cities. And these partnerships, I think, are incredibly important to making you know, the future transportation ecosystem of seamlessness between you know, Uber and, and bike and transit a reality. So that's one that we, we continue to invest in. So Regina, staying with that question of building that link between mass transit and the last mile services that are out there. I know that Populous is offering a data platform that can help cities monitor uh, shared last mile services. So could you perhaps tell us a little bit about the lessons that you're learning in terms of your experience with cities that have um, been successful in really promoting greater choice on last mile, but also equity and access? Yeah, I'd be happy to speak to that. I think that understanding the relationship between new solutions and public transit is really critical. Um, clearly, public transit decisions and infrastructure decisions are made over long periods of time, and we want to make sure that those big investments um, are, are achieving their goals of moving as many people as efficiently as possible. Um, I think coming back to some of our earlier topics um, on mode shift. So. Um, the shift from um, UberX to micromobility, we also need to understand how many people are leaving public transit for Uber and Lyft and other vehicle-based, you know, auto car-based services. Um, and we produce some work on that topic as well. Um, because understanding those overarching trends is really critical for cities to make those decisions. What we've seen um, in terms of public transit linkages are some successes, but also some failures. Um, I've been uh, in a lot of conversations with public transit agencies in the US that tried to develop um, first and last mile programs with private services and really reached stumbling blocks. Um, and one of the key issues was actually data of private companies being unwilling to share any information about where those trips were happening, which made it basically impossible for the public transit agencies to move forward with pilots. That happened in many circumstances in the US. Um, and then they 
found other smaller private sector players to work with. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why I started Populous, to really help serve as a bridge between the public and private sector. Um, we're seeing a lot more progress on um, micromobility with bikes and scooters because cities are now requiring that they share data but they're also making really great decisions around how to reallocate public space. Uh, we work here in, in Arlington, um, and they now have access to Lyme and bird data. They've put out uh, bike and scooter corrals. Uh, they took away a parking spot and put 15 bike and scooter parking spots there. Um, so there's this really interesting dynamic where now cities are being able to make these important reallocations of public space um, to allow more people to access more services more equitably, but they can only do that with data. Thanks. Um, I can't resist going back to Artie and asking data sharing piece. How is that working out with Uber? Yeah, I, I was actually gonna bring that up. It really resonates with us as well. Um, you know, we, about two years ago, we actually launched something called Movement, which is a platform that um, has, you know, wealth of information and data on over two dozen cities from, you know, Delhi to uh, Cape Town to Bogota, um, where you can actually see travel times and street speeds. And now we've actually recently um, added additional data on new mobility bikes, for example. And we've partnered with cities to share this for free so that city planners can use this data to uh, improve you know, infrastructure, to you know, better um, you know, better utilize this data for, uh, you know, city planning that they're doing on a day-to-day on a -day or long-term basis. Um, and I think that has actually worked really, really well, um, and, and we continue to invest in that. The street speeds um, uh, data has, I know, is really, really valuable and one that we're really spending a lot of time developing and, and making available. Thanks very much. Very briefly back to Dan, because I want to try to work in a couple of audience questions, but Electrification, Dan, um, it was mentioned at the very outset of the discussion, the challenges surrounding that. Do you have just one or two best practice examples where you say this is a really good way to approach electrification if you are a city, whether in the developing or the developed world? No. <laughs> but um, Short answer. <laughs> you know, because it really varies a lot. I mean, they, you need to focus on the charging infrastructure, and that varies a lot. You know, like I'm, when I'm in China, most people live in apartments. They don't have home charging. So the yeah. public charging is really key and figuring that out. Um, you know, so charging is an issue. Incentives is the other big issue. And that's a, tends to be a much very local issue, local and regional in terms of how do you generate the money and how do you, you know, get it to buyers. And, uh, and, and then it's the, uh, I mean, really, just information awareness. It's stunning. So those of us that work in this space, we just think everyone knows everything about electric vehicles. And the surveys and the research just show a tiny proportion of people mm -hmm. really have any sense of it. And if you talk about plug-in hybrid, they have no clue what you're talking about. And so, and if you talk about what incentives are available, they don't know that. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's a whole information thing in terms of working with the dealers and working with public information. It's really, um, you know, there's so much to do. Uh, but, you know, I'll just point out, you know, a country like Norway, they're now at 50% market share for, for electric and uh, plug-in hybrids. Uh, ca California is now 10% market share. So it can be done, it's hard, you know, the bus, uh, another example, Shenzhen, one of the big cities in China, they have every single bus is electric and every single taxi is electric. And they have 15,000 bus, they have more buses in Shenzhen than the whole state of California. And a whole bunch of other uh, China, Chinese cities are following that. So there's a lot of ways to do this and there are a lot of pieces. And basically, I think the real answer to what you're saying is, um, is there are a lot of pieces to this, and you've got to think of it, think of all the pieces. If you mm -hmm. just go after, if you just do incentives, or you just do charging, or you do ju just do public information, you're gonna fail. 
Okay, thanks. Super short, if you don't mind, Robin, yeah, thanks. Just to what Dan said, to put it into a rule, if you think about the incentives that your city or your government has, I would focus those on intensively used vehicles, which would be the fleet vehicles. So go first on your buses, go first on your taxis, go first on your delivery vehicles, and so you're getting more bang for your buck. Thanks very much. We could probably take two questions if you're really, if they're short questions. So if you would, just go to that mic there in the center of the room and um, tell us briefly who you are. But if super short, please. Uh, John Wetmore with pedestrians.org. In the world of new mobility, what's the role of pedestrians in walking and are they being forgotten in all the hype? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> go ahead. Absolutely, Regina. And then we'll come to the vice mayor. Yep. Well, I think that, you know, this is where um, we're, I'm excited about micromobility and the new coalitions that are starting to be built. Um, bicycle associations from the past are very much focused on improving access um, to services that are on the street. So expanding the street for bikes and scooters where they belong, protecting sidewalk space where pedestrians should be. And um, we see a lot of cities that are starting to design new policies to carve off more of that space in both places and are cognizant, um, I think, the role of pedestrians has actually um, been more prominent in the last year because of those conversations. Deputy Mayor. Yes, w what I would call active mobility, uh, meaning uh, walking uh, and uh, cycling, uh, should be a, a, a strong pillar of uh, a public policy for uh, mobility. And uh, in Paris, for example, we are uh, uh, investing in uh, widening and enlarging the, the sidewalks. Uh, we are redesigning seven main squares uh, uh, in the city, uh, giving uh, more space, 50% uh, more space for pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, and I think that is a, it's, a, it's a very important uh, part of the mobility policy for our cities. Throughout the rest of our plenaries, we're going to be hearing from a lot of cities that are also devoting a good deal of attention to pedestrians. So the issue is by no means forgotten in the hype. <laughs> Thank you. Um, go ahead, next. Good morning, question. my name is Rafael Acevedo. Thank you very much for the uh, discussion. Uh, I have a question. How, how can these technologies help uh, invert the tendency of reduced uh, uh, public transport uh, occupation? And uh, what can we do in developing countries where we have the problem of motorcycles, which uh, are a health hazard and also a, a threat to mobility? Let me pass the, that on to the mayor of Quito, and you can adjust both aspects if you want, but certainly please talk about those two wheelers. Well, um, as I said before, we have we are lucky enough to have 73% of our population already using public transportation. So what we are trying to do is to improve that quality of service in order for them to keep using public transportation, but in a much better, safer, and greener way. Uh, when it comes to motorcycles, we have been very strict in regulating them. Uh, I think, yeah, and, and I, I agree, that that's a big, big problem in the developing world. Uh, in Quito, we don't have them as much but it is because of regulations. We have been very strict in, in, in limiting um, the circulation of, of motorcycles. We understand that they are uh, extremely, um, uh, not only dangerous, but also they are not good for the environment as long as the technology doesn't change. So, so I think it's a matter of regulation pretty much. What is your approach to pricing on public transport in order to make sure that it is as inclusive and equitable as possible? You have to have a balance because uh, on the one side, I mean, in, in, in a city like Quito, we cannot subsidize uh, public transportation as much because we lack the necessary resources. Uh, but on the other side, it has to be cheap enough to, to, to let people keep using uh, public transportation. So, so it's a matter of, of, of balancing that in a, in a proper way. Uh, for example, we, we, we decided to build our metro only after we uh, received uh, solid studies and analysis that told us that we would not need to subsidize it uh, for the operation of the metro. Uh, otherwise, it would have been impossible to do it because, I mean, we are doing a, a huge investment in building this project, but and we, we understand that's a social investment, 
but uh, we would not be able to afford uh, a subsidy to, for, for the operation of the project. So, so it, it is a big challenge. It is a big challenge how to balance both. But I think that one of the reasons why we have such a high percentage of usage of public transportation is because it's cheap. So you cannot change that as much. Uh, but of course, you have to balance pricing in terms of quality of service as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. We can take one more, please. Uh, hi, um, my name is David Edelman from VIA. And uh, Dan mentioned microtransit, which is, and Arthi also talked about, uh, the first and last mile partnerships that Uber has with cities. And in order, and Dan said that's complicated, which is very complicated, and one of the reasons it's complicated is because of the procurement process that cities generally have and governments have. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, so some cities like Los Angeles and others have been really innovative in how they think about it, but curious to hear from the public sector uh, folks on the panel what you're doing to maybe change the processes and how the, your agencies or your cities are thinking about kind of embracing new mobility and working closer with the private sector to kind of bring these innovations to your city. Great question, thank you. Um, Got a vice mayor and a mayor. Who sh would like to start? Thank you. Yes, w we are saying that uh, uh, there is a kind of co convergence between the public and the private sector because uh, we are looking uh, uh, that, uh, for example, uh, our public companies are buying uh, uh, some other private companies now who are uh, providing uh, ride pooling services, for example. Uh, and uh, we are uh, we see also that Uber is also uh, developing new services, e-scooters, e-bikes. So there is a kind of convergence, and I think that uh, with uh, the, the digitalization of uh, uh, the economy and the, and the mobility, uh, we will uh, have uh, the building of new uh, multimodal platforms that will also provide these services. And the, our uh, work and our job will be uh, to, uh, to, to, make, uh, to make these services, these multimodal platforms, affordable for all. Uh, maybe by the pricing, for example. Uh, so that's, I would say, our role uh, to have uh, this uh, kind of regulation uh, to, um, to make these services affordable for all and also uh, sustainable. Maybe we can also go to you, um, Mayor, and perhaps you could just mention briefly also challenges in integrating informal um, microtransit, uh, something that we're going to be talking about in other sessions as well. But if you have any thoughts on that, because that's a major challenge in many developing cities, um, how to link that up into an integrated whole. That is a big challenge. Uh, that is a big challenge. And first, uh, you need proper infrastructure for that. Not all developing cities uh, have proper infrastructure for, for micromobility. Second, you have to align in, uh, incentives for people to, to use that. And I think we still have a long way to go to, to achieve that. Now, let me, let me just go back to, to the previous question because I think that uh, when, when it comes to the private sector and, and particularly the uh, electric vehicle industry, I think there's still a pending task regarding pricing. Uh, for example, we are trying to encourage taxi drivers in Quito to shift to electric cars, but they are still very expensive. Mm. So, so that, that is a challenge. How, how can you encourage taxi drivers to shift to, to, a, more, uh, to a greener, more clean uh, way of, 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 of moving? Um, so, so I think that's still a pending task, a pending challenge for the, for the car industry. And also it has to do with access to financing. How can we encourage banks to provide credit uh, to you know, encourage, for example, the taxi industry to shift uh, to a cleaner uh, way of moving? Thanks very much. So Robin tried before to um, inject a bit of controversy into the panel, and it, it fizzled slightly. Let me see if I can do so with one last question that literally where I'm asking for one word answer. Does anybody on the panel disagree with Dan that we shouldn't be looking at moonshots? And if so, raise your hand and tell me what your moonshot is. No? No disagreement? OK, Robin. Thought you might be good for. I'm going to <laughs> reinterpret the idea of moonshot. I think the moonshot we need to do now is how do we join together and move at a pace that is ten times the pace we did before. That's a moonshot. Mm -hmm. Great, Regina. 
say the Moonshot is collaboration. Um, and one of the key challenges is not just collaboration between the public and private sector, but we have a lot of fractured public agencies that don't work together. Um, and if they did, we'd make progress a lot faster. Thanks. Anybody else? I would say maybe we have a risk of a, a kind of disaggregation of mobility. Uh, and we will still need uh, a mass transit and yeah. rapid transit. We still need to have also uh, a policy uh, for what I call the active mobility, uh, meaning walking and cycling. And I forgot uh, to say also that uh, for the pedestrians, it's also a part of a public health uh, policy. Uh, we, we have to fight also against sedentarity. So uh, we, we, don't, we, we, we must not forget that these two pillars are also the basis of uh, uh, a public policy uh, for transportation. And then we can also maybe uh, try to maybe to have some moonshots, but don't forget these two uh, uh, important pillars. Auntie? I'm just gonna say, I, I think, I think the, the possibilities are, are endless. Of course, we're, we're investing in, in these new mobilities. I think light electric vehicles, there's a lot of sort of interesting, interesting things happening in that space um, that, that we're certainly investing in. Ultimately, I don't, you know, I think the most important thing from our perspective is investing in public-private partnership. And we've evolved a lot, I think, as a company, again, as I said, and coming to this from a place of wanting to proactively partner with cities. For example, with, with Jump, you know, we actually have those proactive conversations you know, before we are expanding and launching, um, and we want to learn and understand from cities. And so that, to me, really feels like the key to making this vision years from now actually happen, where we can live in a world where we don't need a personal car. I won't go to Dan to say, did that qualify as uh, <laughs> moonshots, but Mayor, you have the last word. Yeah, very quick. I think that we have to align um, the goals of sustainable mobility with political incentives for mayors. There's still <laughs> That's a moonshot, huh? <laughs> many, many mayors worldwide who uh, do not see sustainable mobility as something that could be politically profitable. Mm -hmm. And that's risky and that's scary. So we have to align those incentives and convince them that this could be politically profi profitable because it will change people's lives. Thank you very much, and I know uh, you're working on that yourself. So many thanks to all of you on the panel for this great discussion.